here and we're live and recording again. Hello everyone and thank you for joining me and Vincent today. So this is Vincent Matthews Day. Hello Vincent. Hello Lisa. <laughs> so we've just been having a lovely chat in the green room and um, poor Denby's been shot outside. Yes, I hear me making noises otherwise go for a walk. <laughs> Ted, Ted is here and he, he has empathy for, for, for Denby. <laughs> this is all new, isn't it? So we're, we're like, okay, shut the curtains, lock the door, don't let anyone come in. And, uh, and, and then away we go. And then, uh, and then the animals are like, you've left me outside. That's <laughs> it. He's probably sulking on his feet now. Yeah, I'm sure you'll take him for a long walk, won't you, after we've finished this? Yes, yeah, so I'll take him on the field. It'll be cooler then. I don't take him out on the top. No, it's been so hot, hasn't it? It has. It was 27 yesterday. I know. We, myself and you know my friend Mary, we went for a walk and I was like, Mary, it's really hot. And uh, so, yeah, but we went down onto the seafront last night and Paul and I had supper, which was really lovely as well. I mean, it's such a treat with That's this gorgeous, nice. gorgeous weather. Yeah. You had your brother's wedding, didn't you, on Friday? Yes, that was um, a really lovely uh, occasion because it was socially distanced. Max and Perch was there. We were at Penshurst Place in the courtyard garden and they got married in the doorway. Uh, and we had a little buffet afterwards. It was lovely. It was, I think it was one of the best ones because it was more intimate and less um, noisy. And you did them a very special gift, didn't you? I did. I, I uh, went to there and the, the bride had asked me in January when we had a, a family related Christmas lunch. Oh, I love your influence. Could you do one for me or Princess Place for a wedding? So I had to wait for a lockdown to be so I could go to Pansy's place and sit and sketch. And I must have been only about one or six people there. Wow. So you went to Pensers to sketch and that's something that you do a lot. So you're a, a an artist who draws, but you started life as someone who did quite a lot of um, printmaking, didn't you? I did a lot of printmaking. I mean, really with my journey, um, it's quite interesting how things go full circle, but that everything you do influences the way you were. Absolutely. So before we get on to that, we're just going to have a quick look at Vincent's page so everyone can become familiar with your artwork. So I'm just going to share the screen with the um, magazine, as I always do, so everyone can see. There we go. There we go. So that's the, um, we've become very familiar with this now, the contents page in the magazine. And Vincent was very well behaved and applied very early, so he's right at the top of the list. So there you go, that's Vincent's page. There's a little um, watch video here, which uh, we published this morning on Facebook, which is absolutely brilliant, which is a tour of Vincent's studio. And then his contact details here, his email, his website, and that is Twitter. Now I know though, during lockdown, you have set up a Facebook page as well, haven't you? I have, it's uh, Vincent Matthews Art, and also I'm on Instagram. Okay, so, those two contact points didn't make it into the magazine because you've only just done them, but everyone can look you up, Vincent Matthews Art, on Facebook and Instagram as well as... Yes. It'll be Vincent Matthews SGFA on Instagram. Ah, Vincent Matthews SGFA. Yes. Okay, perfect. And um, so that's your page. And this is an amazing um, drawing here of Bodium. That's right. Um, from a sketch that I did sitting in a field at Ewhurst Green where you get the first views of Bowden Castle. It's almost an aerial view. Um, yes, and uh, you just have to be a bit wary of the cows in the field that I would sketch. <laughs> and, and Nick, if you take Nick with you sketching. Well, if, luckily he wasn't with me that time. <laughs> if I go sketching with Nick and if Ray stands on the nearby, I know he's going to be snivelling behind one of them. <laughs> It's always good to take a friend with you sketching, but you do have to be wary and the cat, as you say, be, be cautious of the cows. That's so right. the other thing I'll share quickly with everyone on the screen is Vincent's website, which is at the moment just a holding page, isn't it? That's right. It's work in progress. So at the moment you can um, see a few ideas of his drawings and we'll talk about some of these um, during. So there's the Bodium one again. And then you've got the thin house, and we're going to have a look at this big digger in real life. 
and churches and there's one with a bit of colour as well. So Vincent does do things with colour as well. He I, just like, does... I like both mediums. Yes. Yeah. So is that pencil or is that watercolour? That's watercolour and pencil. Okay. Okay. So um, you don't use colour that frequently, do you? But no, um, yes, I, I don't. But I, it's, although I do love using colour, and particularly watercolour now. But um, mm. yes, not many people know that I've um, I, I have done quite a bit of painting in the past. Yes, you have got. And you've got some paintings in the studio to show us. I know. So okay. So let's take that off, and we're going to hand over the screen to Vincent, and so we can really sit here and admire some of your lovely work behind you, um, and have a chat as we always do. So. Vincent, what's your earliest memory of making art? Well, um, I wasn't diagnosed after I was three and a half, so I used to go to school at four and a half, part time just painting draw. But my earliest memory, um, my, my mother and my grandmother, I thought I was going to get the telling off, was in our council house at the time, um, they were putting things out of the kitchen for my dad to do the decorating. And when they pulled the fridge out, there was this drawing of a man on the wall. And I was standing there rather red in the face, and they were trying to work out who did it. So when they said, is he brother? No, is this his cousin? No, it can't be him. And I was sort of standing there with this knowing smile, and then it suddenly twigged. And it was a very detailed um, drawing of a man. Um, so that's um, that. then they, they realised that I could draw. Um, so, yeah, so I, I basically, right throughout my life, I would say um, drawing has been a constant. And as you say, they, you weren't diagnosed um, as deaf until quite a bit into your childhood, were you? That's right. I mean, I basically couldn't talk properly, couldn't really talk at all. And um, I used to get terribly frustrated because. I'd ask a question or try to ask a question, but I couldn't communicate it. I couldn't hear what they were saying. I used to get very frustrated. But I was misdiagnosed at three by the men in white coats at Great Ormond Street as mentally retarded, which is very common for deaf people. A lot of deaf people have ended up in mental homes because of that. Um, they didn't even look in my ears. So thankfully, at a dental reception, uh, my name was called, he didn't respond. My mother said, I'm sorry, he's been diagnosed mentally retarded. There was a lady who had a mentally retarded son. She said, he's not mentally retarded. He's clean. He seems very bright to me. I think he might have a hearing problem. So the long, cut the long story short, I ended up in Tottenham meeting uh, a former R um, Polish RAF officer who took four seconds to diagnose me. He was furious. And then not looked in his ear to find he's got no passage in his ear. He's deaf. So, yeah. That's incredible. Um, so how old were you when you met the, that guy and he died? I was, I was two and a half. But it took that while. And then I remember waiting at my grandmother's house with my siblings while my mother went and collected uh, my first hearing aid, which was a bone conductor, a band, a big box. And I wasn't supposed to wear it until a, I saw a specialist. And, and most kids won't wear hearing aids. And they put it on me. Uh, they couldn't resist it. And I stood in this kitchen in my grandma's house, and as they put the hearing aid on me, the very first thing I heard was a Swedish Rhapsody being played on my grandmother's cuckoo clock. And my face just lit up, and they couldn't get me to take the hearing aid off after that. <laughs> so that's amazing, because you've gone into an arts direction, but it's amazing you didn't kind of, you know, if music was the first thing you heard, do you, did, was it colourful? Was it... Did you well, see colours with it? I come from where I used to family as well. I mean, my grandmother used to play um, two instruments. She played piano and the accordion. My uncle used to play the violin. My mother used to play the piano. Uh, my brother could play the piano and guitar. My sister played clarinet. Um, and my dad actually used to, although he used to sing in the workshop, he had quite a good voice. So, yes, it was quite a strange combination. And then there's this deaf child. <laughs> First thing he hears is music. That's incredible. So you you drew you you find out that you're deaf and so you start going into mainstream school at that point, presumably. 
Oh well, yeah, so I was four and a half when I went to this first school. My brother was going. I couldn't wait to go to school. I was very excited. Apparently, I was hopping and skipping all the way. Um, but I, um, yeah, so I used to just paint and draw. My world has always been a visual world, really, because of my deafness. Um, and I suppose it's made me more observant. It's made me more analytical of what I see. It's been my way of um, keeping calm and expressing myself in many ways. Um, so as a child, I was always drawing. I used to paint a bit. I used to make things. I used to love making my own toys. I didn't always play with toys that were given to me. I used to make them. I used to design my own stuff. Um, and so that went through. And, uh, and when we moved to Kent, from my personal point of view, although I came from a very big, close-knit family where we lived in Potters Bar, um, the schooling for me was appalling and I'd missed so much. But luckily when we moved to Kent, went to a very, very good school where I was two years behind and I had a lovely nun who was also Sister Matthews, funnily enough, who taught me to read and write. They tried to get me to write with my left hand because my right hand I draw with and write with, I've got a finger joint thumb. I've got five fingers on that hand. So I'm almost ambidextrous but I have to compensate with that hand. Um, so That's I incredible. Never... I never knew that you had that. Show us that again. So I the never knew that. Thumb. So there's things I can't do that normal people do with a thumb. But it's jolly handy if you've got to use an ink pen or a rotating pen. It's a thing I find. Um, and it's great to see um, the doctor out when I was born. But, um, That's why you're such a good technician. So, secret. <laughs> Vincent and Shelley Rose do all of my um, technical hanging and everything and drawings for layouts for um, exhibitions. And that's why you're so good at it. <laughs> <laughs> you've got a special you've got a special thumb that's i it, never that. knew that how i've known you for 10 years and i never knew that that's I, it's a good party for, for children <laughs> how many fingers have i got how many thumbs have i got no look again and then i'll show them that and then you leave them to it and they're all going like this to themselves and they're trying to work it out <laughs> that's amazing so i've got nine fingers one thumb so they asked you, they tried to get you to draw with your left hand. What happened yeah, so I then? I tried to get you to write with my left hand. I, I, was, I went back to writing with my right hand. But um, many years later, I was uh, doing life drawing when I was at Maidstone Art College. And we were all told to draw with our wrong hand. So the first time I drew with my wrong hand and no one believed I drew with my left hand at all. And that's when I realised I'm, I'm almost ambidextrous. I probably, with practice, could get as good with my left as my right. That's when I'm amazing. Coming, or using a screwdriver, it's probably not to work. I'm often using my left hand. Yeah, that's probably why, isn't it? Because you're yeah. using both hands equally. Yeah. So I've never noticed that. Yeah, so well, going off this one. So if I hold a pint, that's in my left hand. I can't wait. <laughs> that's it as well. Holding a pint. That's why I've no, never noticed that you that you had nine fingers it's not stopped you holding a pint so you went you did you went to school and there was a lot of there was a lot of drawing and painting in I was, your I was coming up in art, it's secondary school um they found out that the the prep school i went to in, in uh kent that I think I must have been about nine. I did this huge Mickey Mouse, and uh, and uh, the teacher told my parents about it, and they saw it. And that, and you know, as a deaf child, parents have never had a deaf child before, and probably not had an artist a member in the family before, apart from my uncle, who's an architect. Um, so they didn't really quite know what to do with me. So they suddenly found there was something I could do. Um, so yeah, so it's quite encouraging. So um, when I went to secondary school, I fact um from two years behind to my normal year worked my way up and uh, yes yeah, so i was nearly always drawing so if i was in an art lesson as you say there are vincent there's a pencil there's something going to draw it so, so what what led you from there into the design world well i was also i used to help my dad out a lot he was a very clever clever man and um he was an all-rounder he missed a lot of education because he had harrowing experiences as a child in and out of harefield hospital or sanitarium with tb he see kids dropping dead left right center and you know he was only six at the time um so he missed a lot and then the war but he was incredibly bright incredibly clever 
it was an all-rounder. Um, and he was a very good supporter of me in many, many ways. And um, But I was also to help him out. He was very practical. So I used to help him out with practical stuff. He'd help him in the workshop sometimes, uh, stuff around the house. And when I was at school, I was also very good at woodwork. I was also quite good at metalwork. And I caused a row between the woodwork teacher and the metalwork teacher. But they were both trying to get me in their class. And I could only do one of them. Um, so... I wanted to do something in the art world or do something with my uh, artistic leanings, but I always knew that if I couldn't do that, I'd be cabinet making or something like that. So how I ended up in design, it's a long process really, but um, eventually when I was 17, I went to Maidstone Art College, had a wonderful time, did a foundation course there. They wanted me to do fine art. And my dad sort of said, yeah, but Vincent, you've got to earn a living. You need a trade. You need a profession. Um, why don't you go into interior design? You're very practical. You're very good at drawing. You always used to design and make your own toys and models. Um, why not do that? He hated interior designers, by the way. He had to work with them. But he always got them confused with interior decorators, which is what 95% of England does. Interior decorators are not interior design. So tell us the difference. Totally different discipline. Um, interior design is much more broad. It's also much more interior architecture, design, and furniture, all sorts of things. So I then basically I went along to meet an architect at Croydon College of uh, Art and Design and their interior design course. And I went to meet him. I, did, I wasn't having an interview. He saw my sketchbooks. We got, we got on so well with chat. He gave me a place there and then. Um, so I did three years there. Um, despite having ear infections and all sorts of problems I was going through at the time, um, and having to have an ear op two days after my final assessment, I was then recommended to go and work with um, Chester Jones in Clive Butcher, um, which was part of Colfax and Fairland. And I had a lovely time, absolutely adored it there. Uh, we worked on such interesting projects, and I was on site, I was doing lots of stuff, um, but it was all drawing board work and using old-fashioned roping pens, and I'm very, very strong in detailing. I'm an all-rounder. Um, so I learned a lot, and I've worked on Gothic libraries. I worked on, um, you know, through my career at Colfax, worked on some extraordinary projects on country houses, yachts, even did a private plane once, worked on that, uh, worked on apartments, worked on jobs all over the world, in Chile, in America, uh, in Provence, in Paris, in Spain, Italy, um, you know, that th we worked on such bespoke work where there was no budget. You just, you just did what was right for the building, what the client wanted. All How amazing, point. no budget, no, no budget. budget. <laughs> <laughs> those were the days. I think we passed those now with the We have, yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah you, I, I know you've worked with quite a few famous people. I don't know whether you're prepared to name drop. Well, it's a bit difficult, really, but um, I know I, I did uh, work on Getty's Library with Chester Jones. Um, and that was four years of my life. Uh, I had to go and do research into Bloor, Burgess, Pugin, and I was handling their drawings. And I had to do a lot of um, uh, detailing. It was about 75 full-size details from 1 to 20s for one room. And it was hammer beams. It was um, carved freezing in bookcases, um, archways, pull-out drawers in bookcases, doors, you know, the whole thing. We worked with a fabulous team of people, of architects, so which is fabulous. I'm not really supposed to say it, but he's passed on now. Um, it's a long time ago. So where was where was this? Um, it, job? Well, it, it was in, in Buckinghamshire. But uh, I'm not really allowed to mention any clients. I've worked no, with I'm sure. I've worked with a lot of very interesting people. Um, and some very, very difficult people. Some people who've got very different uh, image in public from reality. And you think, oh. Um, but the work was rewarding. Um, and it, it was uh, an all-consuming passion and career. It just takes your life over. I had no other life, really. My life consisted of work. Um, and, uh, and then I rose up through the ranks, became associate director at 28. And, and then uh, my, my best friend at the time, who I worked with a lot, William, was, when it was director. He and I were asked to form the proper studio for Colfax, um, Simon and John. Uh, we worked really, really well. Um, but it got to a point in the end where I was doing something like, 
I'd be a lead consultant in one job on site. I'd be doing five jobs on my own, then quite often covering then nine jobs and helping run the studio, often being the one having to look after people in the office. And I was getting into more contractual stuff, dealing with client solicitors, dealing with contractors, checking computer-aided CAD drawings, workshop drawings, and then doing snagging, which is the most mind-numbingly boring thing you could ever ask anyone to do. If you want to punish someone for a crime, tell them to go do some snagging of building work. Um, that will uh, <laughs> That's hilarious. I nearly lost my marble for one job that. Um, so, yeah, so, so I used to have a lot of camaraderie with the guys on site. I used to love that, seeing it all come to life. Um, and it was a real team, and we worked with the best, but generally the best tradesmen. Um, and they were a joy to work with. And some of them were, they were the ones that usually shouldn't have been born the job. So um, when did you move across into now doing your, uh, how did that happen? How well, did the transition from that? In about 2001, I was working on a lovely project up in um, Cambridgeshire. Um, nice guy, but it was a very big, big project, and I was having a very unpleasant experience with um, someone I was having to work with, and and I'd had enough, and um, and I was really looking for a way out then, and um, and I remember having lots of conversations. I sort of in my heart sort of knew, but it wasn't until I got this um, oil painting back in two thousand and three from a lady who commissioned me to do this when I was sixteen that things changed for me in the art world. That's when it, that brought me back because it came back and I was joking with the girls in the office saying, oh, this picture's come back. Oh, I never was able to forget about it. it. Got me into art college with my drawings. So I'll bring a photo in. So I took a photo and it went around the whole building. And then I had the um, head of the textile design studio upstairs coming in. What are you doing here? You're wasted here. You know, why have you stopped painting? Why do you stop doing your art? And so many people are saying it. And, um, and so a colleague said, well, why don't you try one of the courses at City Lit? They're brilliant. So I went along to an a, um, advanced oil painting still life course, which was run by a marvellous guy called Chris Hoff, who later became one of my mentors. And, um, and I, I didn't have a lot of confidence. Was that, and, and when I told him my story of how when I went to West Kent, did my A-level art and did half the course, my confidence was destroyed in painting, it was furious. This is a guy who went to the Royal College, he went to St Martin's, he went to the Chicago Institute, and he was furious. He said, but you paint the same way I do. You paint in layers classically. How dare he? Anyway, so he fired up my passion. And from then on, I was doing lots of evening classes on top of a full-time, full-on job, uh, three hours on my feet doing life painting where you have to mix the colours from all my cool primaries and white and you're given light. Okay, you've got 10 minutes to paint that and you've got 20 minutes to do that. You know, you've got um, another, another hour on that or two hours and you basically have to mix all the colours that you see. It's really challenging. You're really put through your paces. But I loved it. I used to go out of that office in paint-covered clothes and everyone in, in, in Colfax where I worked were looking at me and gosh, you know, it's covered in paint. And um, so I was really, I suddenly found what I was missing in my life. I hadn't been really that happy, to be honest. I didn't feel like a complete person. And I got really into portraiture and I was doing one course there called Self-Portrait Head and we had a tutor from Goldsmiths and she was sitting behind me watching me paint. She said, I want you to paint yourself how you feel today, what your day's been. And I'd just been jilted by a girlfriend that day, so I wasn't feeling very happy. So I did this painting of myself in isolation. And, um, and so I got three quarters way through it. Everyone stopped. Vincent, you should be doing this full time. I can't. Why not? I've got mortgage to pay, bills to pay. You should be doing this full time. So it, it went away. Two weeks later, I was doing the drawing. I just pencil doodling around. She did the same again. You should be doing this full time. So I uh, did um, some uh, more live painting. I did urban landscape where I met a chap called Simon English, who turned out to be very close friends with my first boss's son. And uh, I was sketching out on location around Smithfield Market and some bars. And I had a little book, sketchbook. And I thought, wow, well, I found my thing. And he said to me, I don't see why you can't do both things. You're very good at um, design, clearly, but you're also very good at art. Why don't you do both? 
So he recommended me to do the City Lit Fine Art course, along with Sean Dawson, another tutor I had, who was head of painting at um, London Met. And so that's what I did. So I did the contemporary two-year course at City Lit, and it was life-changing. I got to try all sorts of things. And this will surprise you. I got 100% for performance art, and I didn't even know I was doing performance art. <laughs> you do performance art with Shelley every time you put up an exhibition. <laughs> Well, I was just presenting. I was just being myself. And she said, 100% of performance art. I said, well, I didn't think I was doing performance art. We were. So, <laughs> um, but it was life-changing. What's very good at City Lit is not about degrees. This whole country is obsessed with degrees. I've got respect for people who do it who are genuinely academic. But an awful lot of talented people miss out because they're not. And being creative is not always being academic. And an awful lot of dyslexic people are prejudiced too through it. And um, what's lovely, it gives you a second chance. We were a very dynamic group. We had architects on there. We had a, high, a couple of hybrid doctors on there, all sorts of people, different backgrounds. We had a chap who was disabled, but the most fantastic painter. He used to sell his paintings for thousands. And uh, it was a wonderful course. I loved it. And I was introduced to abstraction processes with drawing. And they latched onto my sketchbooks, particularly Chris Hoff, who was our course director. And he said, I'm going to dare you. To, you should carry on doing that intensity. Because that, you, I love the intense marks. I'm going to dare you to do that across the whole page. It took me six weeks. I nearly lost my marbles. Um, I was drawing with both hands. And apparently, when I left the room, the whole class cheered when I finished it. Um, and then the last term, I met uh, my mentor, Brian Hodgson, and um, we just clicked. He was a Geordie. He used to teach at Camberwell. And uh, he was a very successful artist in his early life. He used to be in Amsterdam, not the avant-garde galleries. He was in Haywood. Um, and he said, um, you do realise you're genuinely um, a nutcase. You are mad. Really? <laughs> How, how, how fun then he said well it takes one to know one he said i'm like you i'm a drawing obsessive and um you know i'm doing a drawing i've been working on for 18 months i built this platform with wheels on and i lie on it and i draw this uh, drawing and he said you've got that same obsession uh, with drawing and he looked through my sketchbooks he looked what i did and he saw in my sketchbook i'd like to play with white spaces and did, he said well why don't you explore that? Have areas of intensity of detail and white spaces. It gives you relief to the intense detail. It makes it easier for people to see. And then you can play more with the abstract process of um, composition. And you leave out things that are not important as you do in a sketchbook. Um, so I started doing my first Indian ink drawing that way on a big sheet of paper. And, uh, and then at the end of the course, he took me to the pub and gave me a really stern talking to. He says, right. He says, you don't need to go and do a degree. You don't need it. He said, you've got all the skills. You've got all the experience. You've got the knowledge. You either put it off or do it now. And you need five different artworks. If you want to chuck a pot of paint at a canvas, chuck a pot of paint at a canvas, because I know you do sometimes. And if you want to do something really intense, do it intense. You don't have to justify it. It's your work. As long as you keep abreast of what's going on. And he says, you're coming on my etching courses because you've got the mentality for it. I'm going to teach you etching. You come to my courses at Camberwell on Saturdays. And I did that for two months. And the first etching I did was the one you sold at the very first Pure um, show. And, what was that? Uh, Remind me. It was the right one. It was very intense marks on it. And, I, uh, remember, I remember it now. I uh, looked to it like duck to water. Um, and then I learned aquatine. And we used to end up in a pub looking like a pair of coal miners covered in black ink afterwards. Um, there's, a theme, there's a theme here, Vincent, and it involves beer and pubs. I <laughs> uh, you'll probably, when you read my post, you probably realise that when I've been out sketching, I usually end up in a pub afterwards. <laughs> I get to a local while I'm in there. There's a lot of pubs and, and beer involved. Uh, Louisa, uh, I should yeah. think Louisa is howling with laughter watching <laughs> this. So you started, that's how you were into etching. And then you ended up down, so you did the first show with me, which was in 2009. That's and right. By, yeah. that's and by then nice. you were living in Northern, were you? Well, no, I was living in Tumbles Wells. I mean, basically, um, the course that I did at City Lit was so life-changing. I gave up my job. I was going to go part-time. 
um, run my own business and I thought well I work out what I need to live on and that's how many days a week I need um, didn't quite work like that I somehow ended up busier when I left than when I was working at Goldfax and, and I used to go to a seal chart etches because I wanted to continue my etching and I go there on a Wednesday and I still get his phone calls and I used to say look this is my art day so eventually they got the message and uh, I was meant to move down to a ride because all of my artwork was influenced by rye. I used to sit on in the, and rhyme sorts in the mud sketching while my then girlfriend used to go around the shops and stay in the warm and dry, come, uh, come and meet her in the cafe all shivering and wet. Um, but I That's could, because you weren't in the pub. If she'd been in the pub, it would have been fine. That's right. <laughs> uh, I used to sketch people in the pub, but I won't go into that yet. But um, so... So it didn't work out why then girlfriend. We were going to come down, move down to Rye, and we were going to get married. That didn't happen. And and it got to a point, you know, I thought, well, really, I'm very much on my own. I could be anywhere. Uh, I no need to be here. I need a studio. I can't keep painting in my dining room, which, by the way, I had to completely redecorate. and had to replace the flooring before I moved because it was covered in paint everywhere. Um, and I moved down to Northern. But I got into Pure because I did my own, South East Open Studios for the first time with Tim Constable at Seal Chart. And I think you were doing the, uh, the Pure, were doing a scale through the things like the South East Open Studios books and stuff. But So I was invited and I submitted like everybody to, and I got in. So that was lovely. It was a big breakthrough. And I was also in um, Art Loco Gallery at the time uh, because I got into the Waterhouse Fringe show. Um, so that was a big year for me, and coming to Pure was a massive change. Um, and I remember being quite daunted and being quite shy. Um, were you well, I, rem I remember the first first year of well, I don't actually remember meeting you that first year. Um, it was 2009, and I had just had Charlie in my defense. Um, but I remember meeting you the following year because by that point you were working out of Brenda Hartill studio. That's right, I was using her studio, I was recommended to her by Turtle Gallery. Yeah. And you were very, very shy and quiet, which is not the man we see before us today. No, I just didn't have <laughs> much confidence, really. Um, and it was all new to me, it was like a whole new world. Um, no, but I loved it. I mean, I, 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 it's the best thing I did was going down the art route, moving down here, because I've made so many friends here uh mostly through the art world and some of them through having a dog um yes uh, anyone who knows vincent knows about there was smoky so back in the day you used to take smoky to uh brenda's studio didn't you okay. and, and brenda and i i remember in, brenda and i encouraging you to do mono prints of smoky okay. do you remember that i do yeah. yes and i did them from life so, we were trying to get you out of the printmaking and more in, back into the drawing because we can yeah. see how that you know you were, you are incredibly talented, Thank and you. Um, and once you started to loosen up, the, you started to loosen up yourself, your personality, and and yeah, and then Vincent arrived, yeah, uh, like um, a tsunami. <laughs> uh, Brenda was lovely. I mean, I, I owe a lot to Brenda as well. I learned a lot from Brenda. She's very patient and uh, very kind. And sometimes she just gives a odd tip here and there. She's been a few words um, and it would be enough. But um, she really encouraged me with those. And I had to work big, had to work fast. And if something weird happened on the monoprint, you just had to go with it. Um, so, yes, yeah, so I was working from life. And I seem to remember I went to the dentist and I think I'd done six, and I put three re rejects to one side. And I came back, Brenda said, all the judges have been round. They've chosen all six. Oh, <laughs> wasn't expecting that. So, yes, they were very talked about, those, weren't they? Those, those six minor prints. Sorry, I can't hear you. Sorry, I'm mute. Because, you're, because you've got your hearing aids in, when you're talking, I'm muting my mic because it's... Oh, okay. Clean. It's a cleaner sound for people listening. So I have to remember to unmute myself when I speak. Um, yeah, to help everyone with the sound. Um, I remember those six and I was showing them as a panel of six. They were so amazing, so powerful um, as a massive like installation. Another performance. Yes, I've still um, got them and more. <laughs> Louisa is saying it's your, it's her, your fault that she joined Pure because... You, Kate, you went along to the Cranbrook show. 
and told me that this woman called Leslie liked my work and I should oh, apply. Right. Okay. <laughs> I remember you asking me, so you do know Louisa Bushy. I think you do I'm on the um, Overstudio's committee with her and also with the Muddy Duck. And she said, can I meet her? So I went and mentioned you to Louisa. Yes, I, um, yes, because obviously I would go and look around the shows and then go, oh, I think that person's got potential and that person's got potential. But back in the day, I obviously didn't have as much confidence in um, what I'm doing as I do now. Obviously, that was quite a long time ago. And so, yeah, it was lovely when people would say, I, I do love the way people do describe me as that woman. <laughs> 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 that woman's been round. And she also says here that you helped to join the Society of Graphic Fine Art. And that's interesting because yourself, Will, Taylor, Louisa, Felicity Flutter, are all SGFA. Tell me about that. Tell me about how you found the SGFA. Um, it, it, again, it's all part of this. I mean, I've got such extraordinary. When I, they say when you need a teacher, one shows, and when you need um, a, a, a tribe, it, it, it's one shows. And at Pure, uh, is when Will Taylor was president briefly of the SGFA. Um, I was at a private view, and Marina Kim was saying, "Well, you know, Will's um, got." Um, this SGFA coming down to get uh, the drawing day in, right? Why don't you go and tag along? I said, Well, I'll go and ask Will. I, I don't want to just turn up, that'd be rude. So I went and asked Will. He said, yeah, Of course. So I met them for the very first time, and we sit, sat sketching a right salt. And, um, and I was sketching a boat at the time. And I just hit it off with all of them. And I just felt, Oh, wow, this is my world. We're all drawing. Um, nuts we're all drawing obsessive and we all love because i love sketching outdoors i get a buzz out of working from life outdoors and um and uh yeah, that was a turning point for me then they encouraged me to enter in for um draw 11 i think it was and uh, which i did and i entered in for another one i think i've been in two exhibitions but before they said well why aren't you applying <laughs> why don't you apply to join and and that was quite a thing as well because the day i had to take my portfolio up um to london i had to take it up to um lion square and you leave it with them and you disappear and come back about 3 3 30 and they tell you whether you're in or not and they have to have a majority out of the council of 12 to vote you in and i probably took far more sketchbooks than i was supposed to have done and Will was very kind. He'd looked through my portfolio beforehand. Yeah, that's what you know, put that in. That's good. That's good. So I had some of my design drawings, had some of my four finished pieces, my etchings, and a drawing I did of rice sorts in there. But on the way there, in a taxi from Charing Cross, I'm not lugging this all the way by foot. I find a taxi driver is Tracy Emmons' next door neighbour. And he's saying to me, oh, Only he's, you, Vincent. <laughs> I know. It's, it's, oh, she's a lovely girl, you know. She's very misunderstood. She's very warm. You know, it's very sad she hasn't got a boyfriend. I said, well, maybe her boyfriends don't like having her name blazoned all over her tent installation. And then uh, and he said, well, I don't think much of her drawing, though. I said, well, she's um, she's now <laughs> in charge of drawing at Royal Academy. I think you better be careful. He said, oh, but she babysits our children. Right, so I thought that could only happen to me. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So you took your, you left your portfolio with them, and the rest is history, really, because you got in, obviously. I did, yes, I got in, and uh, and when they were doing cool print every year, it was photos of them looking at my sketchbooks. Um, now it's a society I absolutely love. It is, um, I love all the pit members. I'm on the council in 2016. I was elected onto the council, and then last year I took over from Stuart as curator. He's been doing an absolutely outstanding job up until then. Um, I, you know, they're very much my friends. I feel I'm at home. It's like I am with a lot of my friends from Pure. It's because when you're an artist, especially if you're into drawing, you meet people with a drawing background. Um, you don't have to explain yourself. We all sort of like understand each other, and we all share a passion and enthusiasm, and everyone's so generous. And I guess such a buzz. I've been involved in so many exhibitions through the SGFA, you know, in uh, Bankside. Uh, we've done the menu a lot of times. We've been at Hull, uh, Froome, and the RBSA in Birmingham. Uh, I've exhibited up at St Helens with them. Wonderful opportunity, and it's such a high standard because it's the only national drawing society 
in the UK and the standards are incredibly high. And so we have drawing days and uh, Flick came along with me to some drawing days as well. Flick's a phenomenal sketcher. Her sketchbooks are just outstanding. And then, um, and then Louisa as well, she came along with me as well. So I think we sort of found um, our drawing family, if you know what I mean. Yeah, it's kind of like SGFA and Pure are very close, aren't we? And um, I've got Les, actually, Les Williams, who's the current SGFA president. He's going to come and have a chat with me in late October when I go back to stop doing Art360, have a little sleep, yeah. recover myself, and then I'll go back to my weekly broadcast that I was doing um, earlier in the year. Les is going to come and have... And Sue Jelly, who is the ex-president um, yes, yes, yeah, of the Society of Women Artists, she's coming on as well. So I've got some really interesting guests for the next session. But yeah, Les is coming on, and that'll be really interesting to hear what he has to say. I think it's a little secret Les. He's like, hey, that's a pint. We often end up in the pub after our meetings, a pair of us, with, the, well, with a few others on the council. <laughs> <laughs> and it's the pub where the society was founded. That's the interesting thing. Where was that then? Where was it founded? Uh, it, it's, I think it's called The Ship. It's um, just off Kingsway in, in Hoban. Oh, I know. Uh, it's very close to where I first worked. Yeah, it was, it was formed in the very into abstract painting in a way because um, a trend that's continued for a lot of the 20th century and really up until fairly recently where drawing was very undermined and undervalued whereas drawing actually is a core skill that you need for all things visual, whether it be architecture, whether it be textiles, whether it be graphics, whether it be engineering, whether it will be fine art, etching, any of those things. And even if you're going to use a CAD machine, those horrible machines I don't care much for, um, you, you're still no good unless you can draw. Because drawing, not only about weight of line, scale, proportion, it teaches you to observe. You observe the more you draw something the more you notice about the more you see and it develops a 3d awareness in your brain you don't need 3d walkthroughs on a computer when you've got that background i don't and um and, and so those that don't draw you do CAD. normally their drawings are flat they're lifeless and they make a lot of mistakes because they don't think in 3d so, no, so it's, it's a, a very good skill. It's a very good skill, as you say, that is essential. I think it is more, much more valued now. Okay. I think we've come, we've come full circle. So, can you give us a quick tour of your studio, just you know, by turning your computer around, so we can have a look at some and talk us through some of the drawings that we can see? Well, the one behind me, you can see that one there. But we're trying not to get too much reflection. That is in Winchelsea again from my sketchbooks. Terrible reflections. Um, that's the corner shop. Um, so I like to work from sketches rather than photos because you keep the character of the drawing and you have the whole experience, you're in the place when you're drawing and you have the memories that go with it, everything. It's much more of an experience and you see more. And then that's another one that I did called The Thin House. That's also in which you'll see from sketching. Um, and then I can turn around and I don't know whether you can see them okay. You can see... There's the one up on the right hand side is the uh, watch house in Rye. One next to it is also one in Dungeness. If I come down a bit, um, you can then see the Memorial Hall in Benenden and then one called the Old Boiler, which is Dungeness, which I I uh, did in 2019 and won the Hanamuli Prize for that. And I got £500 worth of paper. Um, this is a very old oil painting, but um, that is, you know, that's, that's another medium that I haven't done for a while, but I actually do love oil painting, and I love mixing all the colours. I'm sorry, it's very difficult to see when this computer's the wrong way around. There we are. Um, that's it. And that's a composition I took Turner's approach, um, using mostly sketchbook references and rearranged things and called it Dungeoness, even though they weren't like that, but it's just summed up the place. And that's uh, a digger. Um, that's an old rusty digger in Hastings. I've got things about machines as well. And, and that's a quote that I do like, um, and it's one that Chuck Norris um, said, and it's so true. Oh, I think that's per – I love that. 
Yeah, it, and you've just got to show up, haven't you? Show us your big digger. You've got a massive digger drawing, haven't you? I have, which um, is here. See if I can get it on the... There they are. That's the, um, the big bulldozer. And I sat and sketched that. I had to go twice down at Rye Harbour in December uh, a couple of years ago. It was freezing cold. And I sat and sketched that. And then I did an ink drawing of that. And then it was seen at the Rye Society of Artists. It was at Bankside too. And then Shelley and you agree, said, do a big one for Pure. So I had to find a biggest sheet of paper I could find. Um, Shelley and I are bad, I'm sorry. I apologise on our both of our behalves. But it's I'm, fabulous and I'm really glad we told you to do it because it looks incredible. How big is it? It is nearly four foot wide. And it took me 10 days and it's using Indian ink and I had to use my wooden bridge. I had to walk around the, the table when I was doing it to try and not smudge it. <laughs> if you pop your laptop back on your desk, and yes. then um, I apologise, but it is I, I only apologise because I put you through torture, but it was well worth it because <laughs> well, it, it's it, fantastic. It, well, it was meant to go into Bankside this year with the SGFA, but uh, that got postponed, so I'm hoping to put it in next year because I think that's the sort of venue that can take big pictures like that. Yeah, I yeah. agree. And the other thing you've been doing during lockdown, because you mentioned lockdown, was um, your sketchbooks. And they've, well, they've um, received quite a lot of interest, haven't they? They have. I mean, I, I, I like getting out sketching, but during lockdown, we weren't really allowed out. So I decided I should do everyday objects, either in the garden or in my house, um, and, and do a daily sketch. And it was usually relevant to my day as well. Um, and I've always had this philosophy of making the everyday mundane objects beautiful because I think they're often undervalued. And some so of can you show? Can you show us some? So, um, so this is this. I've got three sketchbooks, and that was relevant to my day. I was doing a lot of drawing that day. Um, that was me doing design. I could go on and on. That was a design day. Design started quieting down as time went on. That was uh, the vacuum cleaner. I think that's one of my favourite. I love the vacuum cleaner. That's, and I, yeah. do you know the ones I like? I like the little kind of installations that you do, like of the bookcase and such. Like. Oh, yeah. So I've got, got so if I get another sketchbook, I mean, this was, um, that was the weird dream I had. Um, that one was no bin a garden waste collection so everything was getting out of control um let's see if i can find that was my welly boot it was a wet day i love those wellies i think the wellies are fantastic and um so i can find any others that would appeal let's go on to the third one these sketchbooks are an exhibition in themselves are that was a hot day. That was a hot day. I kept lying in the sun, silly much. Um, so, yes, yeah, see if I can find the bookcase. I'm sure it's in here. That was my bookcase. That's the one. Look at that. And that's got a bit of colour in it. As well. yeah, it has, yes. A little, little yeah. bit of watercolour wash and a bit of colour crayon. So I was playing with some of the medium as well. I've been looking at ways to introduce a bit of colour to some of my ink drawings, and that's gradually what I'm doing. Um, there, there are some drawings where I'll leave white because that serves the um, subject better best. Um, so I did a... It became addictive. I did 110 of these. That was my tool bag. Um, that was my birthday. Um... That was the corner of my room. You, you can see the designer in you. Um, yes. Because even it, how it, they're balanced on the page, you've even balanced out the items on the page. Yes. I mean, I basically... Um, also, a bit of my architectural background, when I'm sketching a building in my head, I'm thinking how it's constructed. So it it's, it's helps when you understand some. And that was uh, given to me as a birthday present by a client. So I use that to keep my drawings clean. Um, 
Yeah. You've got some earlier sketchbooks though, haven't you? Because you used to, before lockdown, you used to take a sketchbook everywhere with you on the train and everything. Oh yeah, well, when I was um, when I was at City Lit, and I, was, I was really into portraiture, and um, I used to have a little pocket-sized sketchbook with me at uh, all times, and if I got bored, I'd sketch people on the train, so these are sort of things. That one, I nearly got killed doing that because there was a girl sitting next to me. Every time I started sketching it, she'd giggle. And the woman would wake up and glare at me, so I put the book down and I thought, and I thought, look, she's got this shocking orange hair. I've got to paint her. So then I got the watercolours out, and then the girl next to me started laughing out loud, and then she glared at me again. So it took me quite a while because I keep stopping. And then this was a chap who was on the train from the country. So I thought, well, he's an eccentric. I've got to do some colour in him. Um, I did sketches like that. I'm just hoping Indeed. nobody recognises themselves. <laughs> well, someone looked at this when I was at Etchingham uh, once, and they said, I know that person, that's so and so and so and so. It was this lady. She gets on that on the 804, whatever it is, to London. Um, and sometimes if they knew that I was drawing them, I mean, that's one guy asleep, they knew I was drawing them, they would pose, and I didn't like that. They'd go all rigid. I don't want to capture them. I'm glad you haven't got one of my husband in there. <laughs> well, you no, know, well, he's lucky. He's probably got more of your than me. But and I, I remember um, even when I did my urban landscape um, one week course one summer, I was in the pub uh, lunchtime, and there were these two East End guys. And I have to find that sketch sometime. And uh, one was bald, and you can just hear him going, "Oh, it's just like you know, you know." Yeah, and I thought, "Well, I've got to draw them," and I did. So, uh, Ted, and I, Ted, is, Ted is listening to you and he had to come up and say hello, didn't you? Hi, yeah. Ted. <laughs> uh, he's uh, he's listening um, away to you. That's just amazing, Vincent. You've got such a store of amazing work there. There's, there's a, a million exhibitions. I'm so proud of you that you're the, the curator of the SGFA that you're you're doing so well that people are now buying your work regularly people are asking to see it uh, you know it's just a, a, it's just brilliant and that you're managing to balance now the diff uh, you know your two lots of your career between well, yeah, yeah. So the I'm, design I'm, and i'm trying to um I'm, I'm trying to do more and more art time now so i know what i need to live on um, I know how much work I need. The thing is with Design World, it's uh, it, it's all deadline driven. It's all like this. And I have to say to them, hang on a minute. Um, you can't do these things in a hurry. That, that area you want me to do, that's uh, four weeks' work. You know, you can't have it like that. So you have that battle all the time. But they're learning. I've gradually educating them. I said this to some of the other, I need two days a week. In fact, I know I can get away with less. Um, because for me, I, I don't want that manicness anymore. I, I, I love what I do. On Sunday, I was not in the best frame of mind. I was probably locked down blues and things like that. So I took my rucksack and I went down to Winchelsea, sat and sketched a view. And I was in this landscape and he saw two walkers and I was just so happy. Um, you know, and that, that's what connects me. That's it. Just to understand yourself is just such a powerful thing, isn't it? To understand that, you know, it's all of those blues and everything. We all have them. We're all normal. We all have those moments. To understand how to get yourself out of it, like Leone was saying to us, you know, it's, it's energy, isn't it? So if the energy isn't and the thoughts aren't working for you, change them. If the energy isn't working, move. Just change the environment and you'll change your energy and you'll start to feel better. It's inevitable. That, um, right. That's absolutely right. It's just yeah. even walking a dog in the morning, just walking down a country lane, that just lifts your mood. Just changes the uh, your vibration and uh, everything's better. So we've got some questions, unsurprisingly. You've had me in stitches, as usual. As you normally do, have Louisa and I in stitches when we're we're hanging exhibitions. Louisa and I spend most of the time in the, in the corner just laughing. I said, this could be, honestly, someone needs to take this up as some sort of like they've got real housewives we need real exhibition hangers because <laughs> it is absolutely hilarious so the questions let's see the questions so jonathan hately says how important do you think drawing is to the young budding artist vital 
even if you're going to do abstract artwork, it's, I mean, some of the best abstract artists are brilliant draftsmen. You know, Pollock was. Um, I would say before doing any artwork, really, you should go and learn the basics, go and draw. Um, too often I hear people say, oh, I'll forget about detail, I'll forget about drawing, um, and they go off and do abstract paint, but they can't draw. Um, and Ken Howard said at SCFA once, um, when he opened our exhibition at Menio, and he, he's a renowned artist, he said anyone can paint, but not everyone can draw. And it, it is so important. So, yeah, I would say to all youngsters, it also teaches your point of view. It teaches you to appreciate what you see. It teaches you to be observant. It connects you with the subject and the environment that you're drawing. Uh, it uh, it trains the brain to uh, be analytical as well. It's a vital, vital thing that I should think should be a major part of the curriculum for school. I couldn't agree with you more. It is brain training, and it trains you to notice what you notice. And it trains yeah. your brain to start being more observant. You're absolutely right, 100%. Um, Charlie mm. is saying, Vincent, what was the best drawing you have done over the years? Oh dear, that's a that's a tricky one. I think the big bulldozer. And I, I've done so many. I mean, I've got one upstairs. I did at City Lit. Ended up as uh, one of the centerpieces of our end of show exhibition. Um, very different style from what I'm doing now. And as I say, I nearly went mad doing it. It was um, intense drawing, uh, covered a whole A1 sheet. That was something I think the bulldozer, because it was using lines and weight of line to produce the tone, and it was showing the drawing. And it's all of the principles that I believe in. I don't like airbrush drawings where someone's just uh, literally made it look flat and dead like a photograph. I like the character of the medium that I'm looking at. I, th I, I, I love that bulldozer. I have to say, I have a particular um, love of those sketchbooks that you've done during lockdown. And um, I love the fact that you're now putting some colour into your work as well. Not, you know, not overdoing it, only where it's relevant and appropriate. Um, and it makes sense. And I think that's the thing, isn't it? That's the intelligence, is to put it where it makes sense. Not to just do it because it becomes a habit or a process, but to also, do it where it makes Also, I believe you, sh it, it, you know, for me, it's about the drawing. I've had so many people in the past, oh, I don't know about colouring that. It's about the drawing. So if you're going to use colour, for me, for my work, it must not dominate the drawing. I want the drawing to show through. So, um, and I can do very representational paintings and drawing. I can do all that to cows come home. But it's far more interesting when you're using weight of line, you're playing with marks, you're playing with space, and then you just introduced an element of colour. It's like the one I did in Dungeness. I thought, well, what stands out for me this, with this building is a red chimney. So everything black and white except for the chimneys. And it sort of, Can you show us that piece? You've got that piece there. I have, yeah. And it, um, it summed up for me how I felt about the building. And that's from the sketchbook. Using old-fashioned nibs. All of my big ink drawings are using Indian ink and old-fashioned dip nibs. So you can't splodge it or smudge it. Um, but I, I prefer it to pigment liners, which I was using in my sketchbook because you've got a different quality of line. It's much richer. And we draw with permanent uh, pigment liners. They do fade after a while. So you always use a good UV glass. But it, it's just something about the process. Yes, that's interesting. So you have to have the UV glass, and and you do a very um, traditional, simple framing, don't you? Yes, I use very simple frames. This is a graphite grey, but I don't like my frames to dominate my pictures. I like them to work with my pictures, and I like space around my work. Um, so you do... Oh, I can hear Denby howling. <laughs> <laughs> He's ready for his walk. Thank you so much, Vincent. That's been, f I've learned, I know I've known you for a long time and I've learned things that I didn't know. I absolutely love the first painting that you, you did at 16, the commission. I didn't know that, that you were working and making work at that age. That's incredible. Well, I and, was painting at 14. Uh, that was, so I, I was just learning. That was my first commission. And I got three more after that. I was only 16. 
That's just amazing. Um, so if I'm just going to quickly share your website, um, um, sorry, the magazine page again, so people can see how they can contact you, because I'm sure after this, everyone, oh, there's your, sorry, I've shared your website first. So I'm going to bring your website up. Hang on a sec. <laughs> Debbie's ready. <laughs> so there's Vincent's website. If you want to contact Vincent, um, go to his website or go to Facebook or Twitter. As he said, it's Vincent Matthews, SGFA and Vincent Matthews artist. And also you can go, uh, you can email him because I'm sure after that, lots of people will be interested in contacting you because your drawing is just astonishing. You are so talented, as Vivian said, huge talent, uh, so talented and you deserve to be um, happy and successful and I, as I know you are and uh, well done and thank you so much for being so generous in sharing your story it's a it's a unique story and it just shows that it doesn't matter what life throws at you and you had everything thrown at you look <laughs> Ted's giving a little howl back to <laughs> what um, it doesn't matter what's thrown at you you know you can just keep on moving forward have confidence in yourself and look where you can go you are an inspiration to everybody. I always believe that if there's a person, please just put the tin hat on and just carry on. You have put many tin hats on and we are all so inspired and just in awe of what you've been through and what you've made of it. So thank you so much. I will see you in a couple of days when you carry on hanging the hanging <laughs> system. <laughs> I still need him to be my technician. It doesn't matter how good he is at the, at the drawing. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, and we'll see everyone tomorrow when Molly will be interviewing Louisa. I've asked Molly to interview Louisa because I've interviewed Louisa about 84 times now. And I think it could get very, very dull. So, but I'm sure Molly will find out some new stuff from Louisa. So it's not that I don't love you, Louisa. It's that I think the audience deserve... Um, a change every now and again <laughs> so thank you vincent very much for sharing with us and we will see you all tomorrow with louisa bye for now <laughs>